Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Muriel and in this video I'm going to be doing a rant review, the first of the year, for Manhunt, written by Gretchen Felker Martin. Manhunt is a post-apocalyptic gender plague story I heard about through grapevine, if you will, that I decided to read for a few reasons. One, I needed a trashy distraction from normal people, the second half of which I read at the same time as Manhunt. Two, I dread the novel featured the ludicrous premise of trans people hiding away from a kind of turfocracy, which as an autistic gender critical feminist with a special interest in the conflict between gender identity ideology and those who disagree with it, tickled my curiosity. And three, I'd also read the author had some pretty controversial takes, shall we say, and wanted to see if those transpired through authorial intent or not, and analyze it in relation to the overzealous current of cancel culture literature is subject to these days. This novel is marketed as horror fiction, as splatterpunk more specifically, and as Filth call. I'm not sure what the latter stands for exactly, but based on my reading of Manhunt, I assume it references any piece of writing that does its damnedest to be gross, grimy, and offensive to decency in one way or another. <laughs> Personally, I think this book also qualifies as pornography, more so than horror, as the splattering of body parts implied why it being splatterpunk was relatively moderate, all things considered, especially compared to something like, say, The Walking Dead. I also think it was trash, and in all honesty, I expected it to be, but oh lodi, were my expectations exceeded. Before I jump into the review proper though, a warning and a disclaimer. This is going to be a rant review, and a harsh one at that. Even keeping in mind that I sometimes exaggerate things a wee bit for effect, because venting about a bad piece of media can be kind of fun, let's be real, and certainly cathartic. Because I don't think this book is deserving of your hard-earned money or attention or time, I'm going to spoil things liberally here. And because this novel features pretty disgusting stuff, I am going to talk about rape and pornographic scenes using particularly vulgar language. If you are sensitive to any of this, please stuck out for your own sake, and just trust me that this book is in fact bad. <laughs> now for the disclaimer, because I value transparency all day, every day. My feminism is unashamedly gender critical, and has been so since before the gender critical epithet was even a thing. This makes me, in the eyes of some people, a so-called TERF, an acronym used as a slur more than anything else given how liberally it is applied these days to people who aren't exclusive of trans people in civil society or radical feminists. But whatever. <laughs> and the baddies of Manhunt are TERFs. They're not particularly convincing baddies, mind you, but I'll get back to that. That being said, I have in fact read this novel from cover to cover, and I have evaluated it using the exact same criteria I employ for every other book I read and review. I am not about to hate on this book because the author is transgendered, but because it is a bad book on its own merits. I would still find it as bad were it written by a man or a woman. And I have in fact read a pretty good book, or a very interesting book in any case, written by a trans woman author before. Unquenchable Fire, written by Rachel Pollack. I have a review for it if you're interested. Despite what genderists may think or say, about gender critical feminists. No, I do not hate trans people, not even slightly, and I would argue, and will argue in the review, that Manhunt is, amongst other things, pretty transphobic at the end of the day too. Alrighty, y'all ready to do this? Let's go. Manhunt barely has any plot to speak of, so I'm basically going to give you all a summary of it, rather than a synopsis as I usually do. Manhunt starts a few years after a so-called gender plague has booted humanity into a post-apocalyptic setting. The pathogen responsible for this plague is called the T-Rex virus. Yes, really. Because it only infects human beings with high levels of testosterone, which should mean all male humans, i.e. men and at least pre-op trans women, except not really, because garbage world building I'll dissect in detail later. Men have become infected en masse by this virus and have transformed into what I'll call zombie werewolves, <laughs> because for some reason they run on all fours and kind of act like feral dogs, who rape, kill, and eat 
not necessarily in that order, anything that has a juicy hole between their legs. Sometimes the victims are impregnated by said zombie werewolves and additional bad things happen to them that I will get back to later. The story takes place near Boston and you learn that Maryland is now governed by some sort of matriarchy full of militarized TERFs who go about preaching to neighboring female settlements about the importance of protecting the women who remain, the dangers of the zombie werewolves, and the dangers posed by trans women who as males could potentially zombie wolf out and kill the women they live with. Enter two of the book's main characters, trans women Beth and Fran, who are manhunters. Manhunting in this context means hunting zombie werewolves to harvest their testicles so their female endocrinologist friend Indy can extract and purify estrogen out of them. Or at least from some of them, because Beth and Fran also munch on part of their harvest raw so they can get the estrogen straight from the source and thus maintain their hormonal transition and presumably not zombie wolf out. Beth and Fran are nearly killed by a patrol of random turfs, then some time passes, I should note that the progression of time in this story is not well established at all, and they get cornered by a pack of zombie werewolves. Beth is violently angry raped, and just as she's about to die, our third main character, trans man Robbie, comes to the rescue and decides to stick around. Mostly to fuck Fran. Then the reader is introduced to the novel's fourth main character, baddie turf soldier Ramona, a secret trans chaser who desperately wants to please her commander, boss buddy teach, that's my qualifier just to be clear, and to convince herself she is in fact a true and blue lesbian, despite her obvious thirst for the lady dick of her male envy and prostituted lover. Boss buddy teach, the novel's main antagonist, is such a tough meanie that you learn even the matriarchal government of Maryland she answers to kinda wants to get rid of her. She's a true believer who wants women to thrive free of the patriarchy and free from the menace of the male zombie werewolves, which in her mind includes all trans women as well. The trans crew get back to morbidly obese Indy, whose body is moreover described in objectifying detail several times in the book. The TERFs march into their town, give their spiel to the populace, and most women there agree with their points. Our protags then decide to skedaddle, especially given Indy has received a job offer from a female trust fund baby who lives in a bunker with other rich peeps and their servants, <clears throat> I mean workers. <laughs> trust fund Sophie wants a baby from her zombie werewolf boyfriend, she keeps her around in a cage, and Indy is supposed to make that happen as an endo OBGYN surgeon doctor. <laughs> Fran is recruited as a diplomat to negotiate with the TERFs because Sophie thinks it's funny to dangle a passing trans woman under their noses and not, you know, dumb as fucking dangerous. Beth gets accused of harassment on a working detail and is turned into a daddy, i.e. a masculine prostitute. So she's a trans woman, she's re-masculinized, or she's dressed as a man and prostituted. Robbie, for his part, is sent a hunting for provisions and zombie werewolves. On the tough side, Ramona, Cheech, and their sisters are hatching a plan to take over the world, or, you know, <laughs> all the settlements in New England, and they get themselves a shiny battleship. They shoot up prostituted trans women and male envies in a building, including Ramona's sub-lover. And she has the big sads and the big conflicteds. Fran arrives with another woman from the bunker to negotiate a trade deal or some shit. There's a dance party thrown for Ramona because she got good on the firing squad. Fran and another turf dance. The turf reaches into Fran's pants, finds the D and freaks out, gets murdered by Ramona, who then agrees to sabotage Teach's turfy plans, wet as she is for trans cock. Back at the bunker, Indy feeds Sophie to her boyfriend because she no like the evil fertilization scheme. Robbie kills the women in his hunting party. Beth, after killing a woman, escapes a convoy of field laborers headed for the turf state and miraculously, by miraculously understand implausibly, ends up back with Robbie. They and the other trans peeps from Bunkerland rise up and set fire to the whole thing before picking Indy and Fran up and leaving for an old World War II fort off the coast where they hope to live in peace away from the baddie turfs. Yet they send a party to fuck up a platoon of turfs out in the woods and then go all Pikachu face when the turfs decide to enact vengeance on them with their shiny battleship. One final showdown ensues, the battleship is miraculously sabotaged by Ramona, Big Bad Teach dies, the turfs retreat, and the gender diverse crowd with their few cis comrades live to see another day in this pointless and ridiculous world. Well, minus Fran and Robbie. Fran dies and Robbie fucks off to find family in the southwest of the United States. Not that I gave a shit about any of it. Oh, yeah. And a metric fuckton of gross fetishistic sex occurs throughout all of this, but worry not, 
I'll cover that too. Structure-wise, this book suffers, like I said, from an annoyingly hazy timeline. I assume several months pass in the book, but I'm honestly not sure because temporal transitions are not all thought out. On a similar note, this novel suffers from rough point of view transitions, though I didn't think they were nearly as bothersome as some other reviewers. Each of the main characters gets the point of view, so there are four in total, and basically all of them feature in every single chapter. I would argue it's a relatively unevenly paced story, switching pretty rapidly as it does between balls to the wall pun very much intended, yes, action scenes and slower, often boring scenes of cartoonishly evil scheming, or narcissistic, woe is me who can no longer transition, never mind the fact the world has gone to absolute shite, flashbacking and contemplation. Then of course you have all the porn to link all of this up. Pros wise, Honestly, I don't think this was as badly written as some, but it certainly wasn't great writing either. Credit where credit is due, though. Felka Martin certainly knows how to convey grossness and ick, so I'll give her that. Her action scenes are also relatively competent, but fuck me if there aren't way too many painfully cringe similes and run-on sentences. Gunshots, for example, are described as the barks of a bichon frisé, which if you don't know is a tiny, floofy little white dog. Now I'm no gun nut, but I'm pretty sure firearms aren't supposed to sound like that. Another example, oil frying in a pan sounds like lips smacking. Does that sound like oil frying to you? What? <laughs> then you have the really weird and gross descriptors, as in every other person's skin or breath smells like milk or cheese. Excuse me, bitch? Y'all need to see a doctor, cause, cause that, that ain't right. <laughs> the zombie werewolf's breath also smells like cum, apparently, even though they aren't exactly fellating one another, so, why? And raw testicles smell like rancid pork bath bombs. Just how though? Then there's the constant edgy because I can usage of the words bitch and cunt. Every single woman and trans woman in this book constantly calls other women and trans women bitch and or cunt. And each female refers to her own genitalia as a cunt. All the freaking time. Hashtag just woman things, am I right? Now, I don't exactly get the vapors when I hear, see, or use vulgar language, mm. nor am I even specifically offended by the word cunt like a lot of women, American women especially, are. But A, it's artless and clearly meant to be edgy in the most immature way possible, we aren't talking about D.H. Lawrence here after all, and B, it's incredibly unrealistic. I'm sorry, but most women, I'm pretty sure in any case, don't call their vulva and vagina a cunt. Pussy I might be willing to believe, that's a lot more common, but cunt? No. And whilst some women, like me, use the word bitch in a variety of ways, like bitch please, very few women refer to other women as cunts outside of an insulting context. Especially radical bloody feminists! I mean, hell, the turfs are the ones doing it the most, and if the author had taken two seconds of her time to actually look into radical feminism, and radical feminist spaces, she'd know the word cunt is pretty much verboten. I also hated the fact every single woman and trans woman uses the word girl instead of the word woman, whether they be young, middle-aged, or old. Now, yes, fine, some women use the word girl for adults in some context, like I'm gonna go on a night out with the girls. And to be honest, I hate it too, I don't like that at all, but women absolutely do not do it to the extent of the women in Manhunt. Not to mention it gets really fucking creepy when plonked into sex or sex adjacent scenes, such as when Beth, after being violently anally raped no less, says the following, fuck me so I can feel like a girl. A, allow me to vomit in my mind for 10 hours straight because that shit is repulsive, and B, if that perverted line isn't straight out of a disgusting porno, then I'm not an SFF nerd. <laughs> Finally, Manhunt is chock-a-block full of American younger millennial slash zoomer it poll wars discourse and pop media references that don't mean jack shit to most people and will become dated real freaking fast. Not that most people will ever read this, mind you. And yes, that includes the references to JK Rowling as Queen Maleficent Turf, but I'll get back to that. Well, what do you know? The character wrote was shite. <laughs> I didn't care about anyone in this book, not even the baddies whose side I'm supposedly on because I'm gender critical, right? Right. Everyone was shite, plain and simple. The baddies were baddies, so shite, with a couple of redeeming qualities to be fair, but the protagonists were also incredibly shitty and relatively repulsive people too. I wished 
everyone would die by the end. Take the trans characters. They're basically transphobic, yes, you heard that right, caricatures, which I find goddamn hilarious coming from a trans author. Beth and Fran are both mentally unhinged and narcissistic sex pests with a shaky understanding of boundaries and priorities. You learn Beth broke a kid's jaw over a toy car when she was six years old and still called Brandon, and she kills a defenseless woman over basically nothing at the bunker, laughing maniacally as she does so. In a flashback, she recounts being booted out of a queer-friendly communal house with another trans woman at the start of the plague, because the women there were, you know, terrified of them zombie wolfing out, and this is a very real risk established in the text. And, you know, What's her reaction? She gets the bitter sads, because it means the women there didn't really see her as one of them. Look, I can understand conflicted feelings about the situation, but Beth shows absolutely no empathy whatsoever for the scared women losing male loved ones left, right, and center. Contrast this to a woman character in The End of Men, written by Christina Sweeney Baird, who tells her husband to sleep in another part of the house, knowing she will never be in contact with him again in order to protect her son from the male infecting plague. Just saying. Fran, for her part, constantly whines and cries about the fact she'll never be able to get bottom surgery now. The apocalypse has come a-knocking. She then gets offered bottom surgery by trust fund Sophie and cries yet again when the bunker goes up in flames. Instead of, you know, Worrying about the fate of her friends, which she doesn't yet know about? She also blithely has sex with Robbie in the dirt the night following Beth's rape by a bunch of zombie werewolves instead of, you know, fucking comforting her friend? Both Beth and Fran also pop boners as they're about to shoot turfs with a bow or crossbow, whatever, because everyone knows murder is sexy, right? and pop boners when they're in mortal danger, because everyone knows dying is sexy, right? I thought James Tiptree Jr. was bad with the whole sex and death thing, but holy shit, it's got nothing on Manhunt. Robbie is also a narcissistic and rage-fueled sex pest who both assaulted a fellow classmate with a nail gun and committed arson when he was a teenager. Yay! What lovely people, am I right? Beth and Fran specifically are basically straight up AGP caricatures, which I once again find hilariously ironic given the author is trans herself and presumably has a massive hate boner for TERFs and their arguments. Speaking of which, the TERFs of Manhunt also suffer from the fact they are cartoonishly evil caricatures or even straw women in this case. Big Bad Teach does have a couple of good guy moments where she lays out her plan to make a better world for women, a world where old women, specifically ones especially reviled under androcracy, will be treated with love and respect. Hell yes! But she is the big bad after all, so we can't have her being too sympathetic or, you know, a nuanced human being. No. Teach, you learn, once worked at Guantanamo, because of course, revels in the idea of castrating the uninfected sons of the women who remain, because idiotic world building I'll get to in a few minutes, has a serial killer wall of pictures of famous trans people and one gay transvestite, Martha P. Johnson, because this is one revisionist bone the woke genderists won't let go of, and ends up performing a fatal DIY hysterectomy on a traitorous black turf in a nonsensical spurt of evil worthy of Daenerys' arc in Game of Thrones Season 8. To drive the point home, I suppose that white women are the evilest evildoers that ever eviled. But I'll get back to that. Then you have Ramona, aka the Chaser, another sex pest who just can't get enough of that wet ass pussy. Sorry, butsy. And Lady Dick. Never thought I'd drop that reference in a book review, yet here we are. But hey now, don't get it twisted, she's the lesbianest lesbian that ever lesbian, alright? And that's all that matters to her. Fine, she thinks about her dad and maybe brothers for all of five seconds at the beginning of the story, but after that it's amoral, feckless, and traitorous thirst all day, every day. Why stick to values or ideals when you can get some trans ass, am I right? Then she's all Pikachu face when the Quiltback Parade won't let her stay with them at the end of the story. Finally, you have secondary and tertiary characters such as Endy or Bunker Brat Sophie. The latter is a narcissistic sociopath surrounded by equally evil rich and white bitches who are really only evil because they are rich and white. And the former is an Indian, because you can't have sympathetic white cis women, am I right? And triple qualified doctor, conveniently enough, who is really fat. Like, really fat. Morbidly obese even. Seriously, do you realize how fat she is? No, let me show you in excruciating detail how flabby and greasy she is. And did I mention that she was a chubster? I never thought I'd use the word fatphobic unironically. 
Yet here we are once again. She's also a poster girl woke ally who thinks sex should have been allowed at pride parades, white women are evil bitches because of course they are, and whose cunt constantly drips for Beth. No, I'm not making that up. I wish I were, but the author clearly thinks women get so wet our fluids drip out of us when we're aroused, as it is written verbatim in the text. Hashtag trans women writing women, I guess? Now, you tell me why I should have cared about any of those assholes, perverts, and psychos, because I sure as hell don't know. The world building was by far the shitest aspect of this shite novel, which is saying something. And y'all know I'm all about that sweet, sweet world building. But oh my god, nothing made any fucking sense in this book. Elements of the world building are tweaked and plot contrivances inserted anytime the author needs to link up fetish sex scenes, violence, or Twitter screening. And that is it. Let's start with the run-of-the-mill apocalyptic setting. You'd be forgiven for feeling confused at how bad the situation in Manhunt actually is, because it's a chaotic mishmash of classic post-apo tropes and failures of logic. You are told the world is now awash with raving zombie werewolves, yet settlements seem relatively unguarded. You have working vehicles, but no explanation as to where the fuel was obtained. You have a fucking working battleship, but no notion of whether or not other other political or military groups exist in the US, much less the wider world. There's a matriarchy in Maryland, but you're never shown what that means exactly. You're told that all psych meds expired a couple years prior to the story, yet everyone seems to be snorting Adderall all the bloody time. That or smoking pot. How the fuck are all these people getting marijuana but not working medicine? MBs also all seem to have an infinite stash of hair dye as well, because priorities mean nothing, apparently. All the protags are grimy as fuck all of the time, even when they have access to running water. Indy is morbidly obese, yet you're told that the going went rough food-wise post-T-Rex virus, so how the fuck is she still as huge as she is? Has she been hoarding all the food like the most selfish asshole ever? Zooming in further on Indy though, why the hell is a fertility specialist like her not trying to ensure the survival of the species? Why for that matter is it anyone trying to do that. If there's an organized policy in Maryland, where the fuck are the scientists? Why is no one trying to crack a cure or, I don't know, encourage trans women to donate sperm or some shit? You can't have your cake and eat it too, mate. You can't say the world has gone to crap a la Walking Dead and present a decently functioning society at the same time. It just it doesn't work. Now onto the plague itself. Oh my god, it's this stupid virus and the zombie werewolves. First, it's very clear the author references testosterone in the text as a proxy for masculinity, even though I know it's actually a pretty poor proxy for masculinity given what I've read on the subject. Most recently, that was testosterone, an unauthorized biography, if you're interested. It's also very clear that she used testosterone instead of genes or chromosomes to avoid the lumping in of trans women with men every other tale of a sex-based plague implies. Except you couldn't even get that right. You are told several times that the virus binds to people with high levels of testosterone. That means all men, except for the ones born after the plague for some reason, and, well, some trans women? You see, the author states that a trans woman whose testicles had just been removed on TV wolf zombied out in spite of this at some point in the story's past. So scrotumlessness isn't a guarantee trans women won't turn, right? Except most believe that simply taking ball extracted estrogen and androgen suppressing plants will protect them. Then you learn later on in the story a woman with polykistic ovarian syndrome wolf zombied out too. And I'm like, just fucking stop, okay? One, even women with severe polykistic ovarian syndrome do not have the levels of testosterone or I mean androgens that men have. No. Two, 75% of hormone-taking trans women are unable to lower their androgen levels to that of female typical levels. That's what the research says. So the way the T-Rex virus works makes absolutely no fucking sense. You also learn that France started contracting the virus, then got better for some reason, and it's never mentioned again, of course. Plus, I'm like, what the fuck didn't Beth and Frank cut their balls off? It doesn't seem to offer any guarantees per the author's own world building, but it'd probably be safer than, you know, munching on rancid zombie balls. Not to mention Fran wants bottom surgery, so why? <laughs> The dangers of DIY surgery and infection clearly don't concern them because Fran pulls one of Beth's 
teeth in the middle of nowhere with a wrench or some shit. And Fran and Robbie don't seem to worry about hygiene or germs too much when they're nose deep in each other's unwashed and grimy assholes. True story. At the very least, Indy, Doctor Extraordinaire, could have done it. Speaking of Indy again, why the fuck is ball munching presented as a legit way to get bioavailable estrogen? One, munching on raw, much less cooked, balls will not even give you bioavailable testosterone, despite what the charlatans of the 19th century wanted you to believe. Two, why not simply get estrogen directly from females via, I don't know, female urine collected during uh, ovulation? Or oh, fuck other female mammals. It doesn't make any sense because the ball snacking is obviously only there to be gross. End of story. But it's not. Added to the ridiculous fact only humans are affected by the T-Rex virus when, you know, sex steroids are pretty much the same across many animal taxa. In fact, in Why the Last Man, all the male mammals die. We have the zombie werewolves themselves. Why do they run on all fours when humans are not made skeletally or muscularly to run on all fours? Why are their bodies riddled with tumors that have teeth of all fucking things? And for that matter, why aren't the Protax scared they'll find said toothy tumors in their rancid balls? Why do the zombie werewolves cock sprout barbs? like a cat's and grow up to 11 inches if it's not to fulfill some creepy rape kink. Why do they produce killer fetuses who erupt out of impregnated victims' wombs like xenomorph chestbursters after three months? And why do those babies become sexually mature at one year old? Viruses are subjected to natural selection too. And none of this shit makes sense. How is this thing even transmitted then? Like, what's the fucking point, bruh? Other than to make the story as moronically gross, edgy, and rapey as possible. I don't necessarily mind grossness or body heart, but make it make some goddamn sense for fuck's sake. And finally, we have the turfocracy. Like, okay, the novel relies heavily on the basic premise of there being turfs in power, but it doesn't change the fact it's dumb as fuck, and it's precisely one of the reasons this book is so laughably bad. In what universe are so-called TERFs numerous enough, or powerful enough, to establish threatening polities after an apocalypse? I'm not trying to say women are incapable of organizing into working societies without men, or that we can't be strong, power hungry, or even morally corrupt. But like, it has to be somewhat realistic. A good example of this is what you get in Why the Last Man, or hell, even The End of Men. At one point, you see a couple of randos picketing for trans rights outside of TERF headquarters in some city near Boston, or was it actually Boston, doesn't matter. Are you for fucking real, bro? I guarantee you that would never happen in a million years in a real-life post-apocalyptic scenario. However unfair it might be, people wouldn't give a single flying fuck about the tiny remaining percentage of the already small 0.3 to 0.6% of the population who are trans. And that's just a fact, okay? Just as they wouldn't give a crap about feminism, gender critical or otherwise. People will be trying to survive and rebuild, hopefully along, you know, more or less egalitarian and progressive principles, but even then it would go into the super fine print of minor minorities. And that's the best case scenario too, let's be real here. Then you have the absurd portrayal of the TERFs themselves. As I've already stated, it is clear the author knows absolutely jack shit about actual radical feminist theory or actual radical feminists. Rad fans are absolutely anti-sex work. I've spoken to enough of them to know this, all right? And kink critical too. And a polity founded along their theoretical values and ideals would not include prostitution, all right? Much less trans prostitutes, for fuck's sake. At most, I'm willing to concede the baddie turfs, if you wanted to make it a bit more realistic, would force trans women into perhaps reproductive slavery and, you know, use them as studs to keep the species going, sure. But certainly not fuck them. Using the grossest of BDSM play, no less. Like, hello? <laughs> they wouldn't trans their sons either? Like, what the fuck, dude? Castrating them as a safety measure or even an ideologically driven one? Sure, why not? I can buy that. But why the fuck trance them and gather them into a Maynard core of all things? One, wouldn't it be a thousand times more interesting thematically 
to explore masculine identity in these unfortunate eunuchs? And two, why the hell would Ratfems name a core after the followers of a male deity, in this case Dionysus, when the Galli, castrated male servants of the great goddess Kybele, were a thing in the ancient world too? Stupid, stupid, stupid. <laughs> Plot-wise, it was also ridiculous to have literally militarized turfs with military-grade weapons be beaten by a ragtag band of gender identity druggies, but, you know, whatever at this point. Manhunt was purportedly written to address the lack of trans rep in gender plague stories. Of course, one could argue they are covertly represented in those stories by the simple fact they survive or perish according to their biological sex. But of course, material reality where sex is concerned is triggering to some genderists, so I guess that wasn't good enough. Okay, turning the saltiness down just a bit for a minute, I do think it is perfectly valid to want actual trans characters in those kinds of stories, and I do believe you could make something interesting out of that premise. But uh, for crying out loud, this asswipe of a book ain't it. <laughs> there is one theme, and one theme only in Manhunt. Tav's bad, trans good. And it doesn't land, because despite the author clearly wanting to portray women worried about female-only spaces as mean bitches, the fact is that Tufts, in her own bloody story, according to her own bloody world-building, have a perfectly legitimate reason, post-T-Rex virus, to fear all trans women, as they could all, potentially, turn into zombie werewolves. Like, I'm sorry, but women trying to stay alive and unraped doesn't exactly scream evil or on the wrong side of history to me. In all fairness, there's also the theme that cis people more or less bad, unless they want to fuck trans people. Cue this line dropped by Robbie towards the end of the story. If he'd spent his time preparing for anything since the end of the world, shooting a bunch of screaming cis idiots, was it? And white, middle-aged women are the most pathetic, gross and evilest cunts that ever walked the earth. Like, I'm not even exaggerating here. The contempt thrown at white women, older women, lesbians, and women who simply have a different opinion regarding gender stuff is the most off-putting thing in this book. Well, that and the porn. And honestly, I'm way too generous calling this a theme. Twitter screeding is more apt of a descriptor. Y'all remember that porn I keep mentioning? Well, it's all over this freaking thing. <laughs> the characters spend so much freaking time thinking about bonking or actually bonking in the grimiest ways possible. No one ever washes. No one ever uses protection, of course, though. Like, people smoke pot, but condoms don't exist anymore, apparently. Copious amounts of spit and juices are produced, and it's all about that daddy and mommy bullshit during sex as well. Like, I'm sorry, I know not all BDSMers are bad people, but kinks are not all created equal, and I don't believe in the woke bullshit that one can't kink shame. I will fucking shame any kink I like if I feel like it, alright? Free speech goes both ways, and calling your sexual partner daddy or mommy is fucking disgusting as far as I'm concerned, or I just bleh. Rape is also horrifically disgusting as far as I'm concerned, yet Beth mildly gets off on her own violent group anal rape at the hands of zombie werewolves. Plus, you know, recall that line I dropped in the writing section with Beth wanting to be fucked so she can feel like a girl? Once again, bleh. And it starts in the very first chapter too, as Beth, was it Fran, same difference really, imagines, just as she's about to shoot a woman no less, teach the big bad in dominatrix gear running a leather riding crop against her naked ass and pops a boner in the process. Sex and violent impulses dancing repulsively together. Isn't that nice? Honestly, I was borderline more bothered by the gratuitous and disgusting consensual sex than by the rape. I mean, the edgy horrificness of the rape is unnecessarily ramped up by the fact it's, you know, zombie werewolves with barbed dongs doing it, right? But I guess you can make a case for rape featuring in a horror story set in a post-apocalyptic setting. Fine. Though... Less fine when you have the author's take on the subject in mind, which I'll get to in a minute. The consensual sex and general horniness of the protagonists, however, are way too frequent and pointlessly gross to be justified, much less makes sense. Take this line as another example. He paused, open mouth full of half-chewed mush. Beth wondered if he breathed through his nose that loud when he sucked cock. One who thinks like that? And two, what is the fucking point of this sentence? Other than, you know, confirm Beth in this instance 
a sex craze. This is why I think Manhunt is as much porn as it is horror, quite frankly. What's more, me thinks the author catered to her own proclivities when she wrote this, which is fine in fan fiction, but uh, much less so in published fiction. I generally do not care about authorial slash creative intent at all. I evaluate media or art on its own merits, and that's that. I also, you know, separate art from the artist quite strongly. And don't get me wrong, I largely did so here as well, right? Again, this book is bad on its own merits, but given the very obvious nature of the material, and given the little I've learned about the author, I find I can't quite ignore authorial intent as easily in this case, especially given the hypocrisy I find permeates a lot of the discussion surrounding such things in today's media. To me, it's very obvious this story caters to the author's proclivities, like I said, and not much else. It works as a revenge fantasy against those meanie turfs, except not really, and it works as hate and contempt-fueled porn. But it certainly does not work as a revolutionary, interesting, much less meaningful take on gender plague stories. The main thesis of turfs bad, trans good doesn't work, because the turfs are both cartoonishly evil, and justified in their fear of trans women, per the author's world building. And because the trans protagonists are sex-crazed and narcissistic AGP caricatures, us gender-critical feminists supposedly see all trans people as. Newsflash, we don't. Per the author's own character work. I even saw a trans review on Goodreads comment that she thought at first the novel had been written by, you guessed it, a tongue f I'm sorry, but that's just fucking hilarious to me. And there's the JK Rowling stuff. It's actually not nearly as offensive as some people feared, but it is precisely as fucking moronic as I thought it would be going in. Basically, as the gender diverse parade enjoy a quiet moment around the cooking fire in their World War II fort, one of them starts telling the story of what happened to the mother of Harry Potter, Queen Turf Rowling herself. She was holed up in her Scottish castle with some friends, one of whom had polycystic ovarian syndrome. Polycystic ovarian syndrome woman zombie wolfed out and a fire erupted in the entering panic. The castle collapsed, killing everyone inside. So no, Ms. Rowling is not murdered by a trans mob or anything like that. Still, I will point out that in real life, she has received an ungodly amount of rape and death threats from rabid trans rights activists. So a trans author mentioning her death in such an obscene novel isn't exactly the most neutral thing in the world either. What's a lot stupider, however, is the turf militia being referred to as the Knights of JK Rowling by one of the trans protags. Just... okay, I guess. Though this is another reason why this novel will never have mass appeal, or mark the history of literature, even queer literature, in any meaningful or lasting way. Because like it or not, J.K. Rowling is not considered evil by the vast majority of people. And however much woke genderists cry about it, Harry Potter has entered the canon of classical children's literature, and Rowling's name is attached to that for however long humanity persists. So y'all do yourselves and your mental health a favor and get over it, okay? But fine, you don't care about the Rowling stuff. How about this? The author has stated publicly on Twitter that she believes there should be more rape in media, or at least literature, and that she will endeavor to put rape in every single thing she writes. Yay! Plus, like I already said, this novel just oozes contempt and hatred. I saw a positive reviewer on Goodreads state this book is angry, but I disagree. It is much more than just angry. It is full of loathing and loathing-fueled lust. It is misogynistic, yes. It is transphobic, yes. It is lesbophobic, yes. It is fatphobic as well. Hell, it's cisphobic too, in a way. And it is even, yes, misandrist. One of the characters says that men are now able to rape and murder as they've always wanted to. And Beth has this to say about the turfs after their final showdown and after they abandon some of their wounded. They don't love each other. They're just like men. 
So men can't and or don't love, apparently. And feminists are supposed to be the man-hating ones? I wouldn't mind any of this nearly as much were it not for the hypocritical conversation around this bloody thing. Positive peeps on Goodreads have of course stated that anyone who hates on this book is transphobic, right? And or a turf. Even though I'm certain that had it been written by a man or a woman, it would have been criticized a lot more harshly by a lot more people. We live in an era where it's seen as problematic to like, for example, Lovecraftian fiction. Recall George R. R. Martin was poo-pooed by N.K. Jemisin was it? I believe that, uh, was it Worldcon when he cited Lovecraft as one of the greats of horror writing and one of his personal sources of inspiration, or something to that general effect. You're hardly allowed to love, much less recommend, The Mists of Avalon because of its admittedly horrific author. You can't read Ender's Game without someone going on a tirade about the author's homophobia. And of course, you're a bad person if you still love Harry Potter, but don't go out of your way to point out all the supposed isms in it. Because J.K. Rowling is the Hitler of children's fiction now, apparently. But somehow this author and this pathetic excuse for a novel get a largely free pass from what I've seen. Because why? The author's trans? And what, they're the most oppressed of oppressed minorities du jour? And so what, their works and personas can't be criticized like everyone else's? Do you see the fucking double standard here? Can you smell the nauseating hypocrisy? Because I sure freaking can, and it pisses me the hell off. Ultimately though, Manhunt's reception is just symptomatic of a wider, toxic, and unintelligent trend in media promotion and media analysis, and... That's a damn shame. So I recently discovered the Miller test used to determine the obscenity or lack thereof of a piece of fiction. Let's apply it to Manhunt for funsies. One, would the average person applying contemporary community standards find that the work as a whole appeals to the prurient interest? Check. Two, does the work depict or describe in a patently offensive way sexual conduct or excretory functions? Check. Does the work? as a whole, lack any literary, artistic, political, or scientific value, checkity check check. Congratulations, Manhattan is in fact obscene, yay! Like I said, I will give the author a point for conveying grossness with a measure of skill, and also for, you know, writing action scenes with relative competence. Yes, I will give her that. And another point for the cover art, for which she's not responsible, but still. Whilst it's definitely on the nose, I still think it works and shows a respectable smidge of humorous creativity, shall we say. The tagline, however, is dumb as fuck. <laughs> Manhunt is, very honestly, one if not the worst thing I have ever read in my life. Like, holy shit, it was actually bad. Like, you know, I do exaggerate things just a wee bit in my rant reviews in general, but I mean every single thing I said. Oh, it, it was really that bad. As such, I gave Manhunt a symbolic 1 out of 10, the lowest rating I've probably ever given to any book. Just don't read it. <laughs> Or do and have a rage and repulsion fueled laugh, I guess, if that's your thing. So that concludes this pretty long, salty as fuck, letter rip for the lols rot review. I meant every single thing I said. I mean, I had fun doing this, but I mean all of it. Like, this book is trash, absolute trash. <laughs> and, you know, I would rather prefer reading awesome books that I can squee and rave about to my heart's content, but I will not deny that <sighs> there's a certain gleeful, cathartic release one gets when venting about, you know, genuine trash like this. <laughs> so I hope some of that gleeful catharticness transpired and was communicated to you all. <laughs> Of course, I welcome diverging opinions, respectful conversation about this. If you read it and thought it was trash as well, please do share your thoughts. If you read it and liked it, please do share your thoughts. Tell me why you loved it and tell me why I'm wrong. But again, respectfully. So on that note, I hope you all have a lovely day, evening, or whichever time of day you prefer. Do take good care of yourselves. Thank you for the continued support, and I shall see you all relatively soon, probably in my July reading wrap-up. But until then, bye-bye.